Good morning, everyone. I wonder when the last time was that you went to a wedding. I hope it went well. Of course, it's difficult to do uh, things like weddings at the moment. In my experience, it takes many months of planning. We want the very best for the happy couple as they start their lives together. But things don't always go according to plan. I expect some of us have a near disaster story of one kind or another. At our son's wedding, we arrived at the reception and discovered that there was no electric power, no cable for the musicians. What were we to do? Two of our guests kindly drove off to the shops distant away, find a cable and got it back how they were and how grateful we were. So today we read the story of the famous wedding in Cana and this at the end of the season of Epiphany, the season of Revelations, recognizing that this first miraculous sign reveals and points to deeper truths beyond itself. Can you imagine in your mind's eye the wedding at Cana. This is how several artists have imagined it. This picture, a rather grand wedding, you'll find in the Louvre opposite to the Mona Lisa. But each artist interprets the wedding in a different way. And there we see a wedding, ve a, a purification vessel, a huge water pot. But I like Murillo's painting of the wedding feast. If we could have that back, please. The last one. Don't think we're going to get it. The last, the number four. That's it. That's the one. I like Murillo's marriage feast at Cana which tells us so much about the family gathering, the beauty of this event. The story provides a rare and beautiful insight into the family of Jesus at the threshold of his public ministry. John clearly crafted his gospel very carefully from direct experience of being with Jesus and includes altogether seven signs in his gospel which have special meaning and purpose. In fact, John is the only gospel writer to include this story, and it's interesting to think why. The story has certain quite obvious meanings, but other deeper symbolic meanings, some of which John may not have been aware of in his lifetime, but we recognize today in the church. Now today, the town of Kerbet Cana is thought to be the correct location of the place that Jesus visited. It's just a ruin on a hill. But archaeologists have recently found evidence of Christian pilgrims visiting this place from the sixth century with pilgrim graffiti and two ceremonial water jars, rather like the ones described in the gospel, in a chamber used for worship. Josephus, the historian, also identified Cana as a significant place. Well, what was marriage like in Jesus' time? They were lengthy events um, following the laws laid down in the Jewish Torah, perhaps a bit like Indian weddings. The festivities could go on for a week or more if the groom's family could afford it. According to ancient custom, the bride's veil would only be lifted on the seventh day when she would be fully revealed to him. Friends and family traveled from afar and we're told Jesus and his disciples were invited traveling three days to Cana. So weddings were important occasions where family connections were renewed over food and drink. The New Testament has a number of references to weddings and wedding feasts brides and bridegrooms. Indeed, 
the concept of the church as the bride of Christ is hinted at in the Gospels and described in the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. And there we read in verse 9, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. It seems to have been going pretty well at the feast, perhaps too well. Everyone was having a good time. But it becomes clear to Jesus' mother Mary, who's keeping a very careful eye on arrangements, that the wine is about to run out. Disaster is about to strike. The party would be a disappointment. And knowing that this would be such a shame to the, comp uh, to the couple, she does her best to rescue things. She has to act fast. And so we have this urgent request by Mary for her son to provide a solution. She comes to Jesus quietly and with complete confidence that he will have the answer to the problem. But strangely, Jesus seems a bit reluctant at first, suggesting it's not really their responsibility to sort out someone else's problem. Why take responsibility for this predicament? But more is at stake for Jesus the, than the interruption of his social life. The hour for Jesus to reveal his glory puts him on a path that leads inexorably to suffering and death. The prospects are too terrifying for Jesus to embark upon that path a moment sooner than he must. In this moment, we recognize the special relationship between Jesus and his mother Mary, the understanding that they clearly shared regarding his special mission to the world. In this crisis, Jesus realizes that the moment has now come to show himself for who he really is. There would be no going back. In obedience and with grace, Jesus acts as the occasion requires and saves the day, just like my friends who went off to find that cable. The task he gives to the servants seems quite nonsensical. Do whatever he asks you to do, Mary tells the servants. They are to take the six huge stone water jars used for ritual purification, ceremonial washing, that was so important to the Jews, and they were to fill them to the brim with water. Then they were to draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Miraculously, we don't know how, the molecular composition of the water changed to wine. Not any old wine, but the very best wine. And there was plenty of it. But the miracle is discreet. No one at the feast knows what has really happened other than the servants and those closest to Jesus. It would have been the bridegroom's responsibility to provide the wine and the food in the first place, but he seems not to know the source of this special new wine. And so the feast goes on without disruption. Everyone brings out the choice wine first, says the master of the banquet, when he tastes it, quite amazed. But you have saved the best till now. It must have been quite a party. The capacity of the jars was more than 240 litres. So by my estimation, the guests had the equivalent of about 300 bottles of excellent wine, even better than this. More than enough for everyone to have a really good time. And so the party went on. Well, what can we learn from this story today? What essential lessons does this miracle at Cana hold for us? John tells us that it was through this sign, this miracle, that Jesus revealed his glory for the first time. John saw glory in Jesus. In other words, he saw his splendor, his power, his authority. This will have made a huge impression on his new disciples. 
giving them confidence to believe and continue following him. Do we find our faith inspired too? Perhaps we can recall times of great difficulty in our own lives when we have felt the joy of God's presence and God's goodness when we didn't expect it. When he has perhaps changed our own water into wine. In this amazing behind the scenes view of Jesus' ministry, we see him quietly and humbly meeting very human needs. We also see the obedience of the servants who faithfully follow Mary's instructions, do whatever he asks you to do. Simple and straightforward. This is surely a message about our own need to listen and to collaborate with God in achieving his good purposes. Like the servants at the feast, we're expected to humbly apply ourselves to his transforming work in the world. We can see Jesus devoting time to his family, engaging with the joy of the wedding and the happy couple, joining in as part of this special event. His presence at the feast surely confirms the goodness he attaches to marriage and to family life. We too should surely give a priority to building up our families, particularly in these difficult times, as we sometimes find ourselves thrown and perhaps too busy to spend time with those nearest and dearest, even making a phone call. We can see the water changed to new wine, the best wine, a symbol of the new life in Christ, the new way we can follow. Gone are the old rules symbolized by the Jewish laws of purification. And in their place, we enjoy the perfect sacrifice of Christ, bringing about a new covenant through his shed blood. Later on in John's gospel, John 10, 10, we read the words, I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance. May it be our experience that Jesus touches the ordinary events and the relationships of our lives and transforms the ordinariness into the extraordinary through his new wine and with signs of his wonderful glory. Amen.